Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to those of you who are coming here for the first time, and welcome back to those of you who are not coming here for the first time, to the Legatum Institute, a public policy unit whose researches and publications into the question of why certain nations, individuals and societies attain prosperity and why others do not make it unique in the international community of think tanks. Our concern is with the way prosperity is attained and how internationally that might be understood. And in doing so, we draw upon insights from a variety of disciplines, interdisciplinariness being our trademark activity. Uh, my name is Howell Williams, and as a senior advisor at this institute, I look after the Culture Prosperity Programme. And when that programme was initiated three years ago, I was very clear, and was able to persuade my colleagues that uh, they should back this idea, that the architecture of prosperity should be fundamental to the programme. Architecture being understood, of course, not just as a question of houses and buildings and bricks and mortar, but also encompassing all the social historical, philosophical, public policy aspects, a question of how we live and where we live. And those questions are shared as abiding preoccupations by our team this evening, uh, who come from a variety of perspectives, uh, but have insights that they're eager to share uh, with you this evening. Um, and we have with us, again, to my right here, Nicholas by Smith, whose publication, Heart in the Right Street, <laughs> widely available at a bookshop near you, in other words, the Legatum Institute for the purposes That's this evening, best. and at a one pound discount? A one pound discount, which is all we can afford with actually outselling yeah. at a unit loss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and Nicholas is the founding director of a really pioneering organisation, a uh, think tank called Create Streets, the clue is in the name. Uh, which is a piece of advice uh, that is taken increasingly seriously. Um, and then on my left, there is Siren Reagan. I tend to call her Siren Reagan because uh, when I first knew her, she was Siren Reagan, but she's now Siren Abbey in her married name. And she's a very eminent uh, psychiatrist in the National Health Service. Um, and she's been working mainly in inner city London boroughs. Uh, but has now been transplanted to the more elevated spires and contiguous area uh, in Oxford and in the Radcliffe Hospital as well, where she works. And within the South Oxfordshire Area Health Authority. Yeah, South South Oxfordshire. Oxfordshire. Um, yeah. Rowan Moore's elegant approach to the questions of architecture over uh, recent years, the architectural critic of the Observer, has won him many admirers. And many of those admirers will wish to be informed that he is also an author with something to sell here this evening. Um, and he's got Slow Burn City, London in the 21st century, um, which is again widely available and is published by Picador. Um, and Rowan, uh, many Rowan's uh, articles have been dealing with the question indeed of the Boris Johnson legacy in architectural terms. And then we have Ben Page, who represents a very significant tribe in contemporary London and contemporary national life, the tribe of the posters, whose energetic faith and the ability to read the rooms of public opinion remains entirely undimmed by the passage of time and the passage of years and various polling disasters. <laughs> but he and his organisation... I am the least inaccurate pollster in Britain. <laughs> yes, I'll I was about to say. Uh, he, was, he produced <laughs> several polls that showed that the last general election might actually have a different uh, result from the one that was so widely predicted beforehand. Um, and we'll start, therefore, um, with Nicholas and Nicholas's advocacy and create streets and, and all of that. Um, Nicholas, are you anything other than an arrant populist devoted to the cause of denigrating the architectural profession and raising the level of public ignorance thereby? Uh, the, uh, the joy of answering questions from Hal is you always feel like you're sort of writing a Tintin book after Proust has just come and posed the question. Um, that was said to give me time to think of a reply. Um, am I ever... Well, we, it's interesting, there's an there's a, there's a architect present, there's several architects present, but there's one I'm looking at right now, uh, Roy Bragan from HTA, and his, his uh, colleague and boss, uh, who's actually running for the presidency of Reba at the moment, Ben Derbyshire, some months ago uh, referred to Create Streets as populist. And I was about to respond, saying, no, we're not populist, we just want what is popular. And I said, no, we will take the charge populist. We will take the charge populism. And I think um, if by populist we mean 
worrying about what people want to see built near them. Hmm. And if by populist we mean wanting to see built where people are provably happier and where their physical well-being is higher and where they're more likely to know their neighbours in a controlled way that they feel good about and where their children are likely to play outside more frequently on a regular basis mm. and to do better at school. If populism means throwing aside, and I'm going to try and be provocative here, but throwing aside the concept of good design as something which is platonically um, a pint upon by the, uh, the great and the good and the educated who have a level of insight that the rest of us are, are, are not vouchsafed, but actually saying in this new world of metadata, this sentence will end ultimately, um, but in this... Um, Me uh, is metadata the same thing as big data? Me Me just uh, it's bigger. It's bigger. It's even bigger. It's even bigger. Big as as, as yeah. computer... Because this this, the sentence got some, some cesura there. Um, uh, you know, this is a very exciting time in social sciences, in psychology and in city studies. Our capacity both to generate and to understand and to analyse data about where people are happy, about where children do well, about where things happen or don't happen, is just exploding. And above all, our capacity to access it and then to research it. So I think the, the key question that we're asking, and I think what drives us so with, I think with increasing confidence to the view that the way to create cities is to find that middle space between the suburban outliers at one end and the, and the huge blocks at the other, is because... I was going to say in every, that's going too far. It's in, a, in a study of um, uh, 86, maybe 85, if you buy the book, you can check whether it's 85 or 86, um, uh, studies looking at whether living in a very big building is correlated with you know, better mental health, better physical health, knowing more of your neighbours. Mm -hmm. We find that, again from memory, I think 69%, no, 79% show that it isn't. About 11% show there's no correlation, about 11% say the opposite. So we're very interested in the data and where people are happy. And that place in the middle, where you get the advantages of living in a house, which are provable, but also the advantages of being close to your neighbours and in walkable distance of shops or schools or things, is what we're arguing for. But not through populism, through data on popularity and well-being. And taking seriously what people tell you about beauty. Beauty, what they think about beauty. Beauty really matters. <coughs> it's, the, it's one of the many, um, I think, lies uh, propagated by various uh, uh, forms of philosophy and professionalism over the last 50, 60 years, that beauty is purely subjective. It is demonstrably false. Um, in every single survey that we have done or that we can find of what people in Britain, that's when we've mainly looked, but we've looked a bit elsewhere, like in the built environment, or indeed in their, their world environment, it is incredibly predictable. People like buildings at a human scale, they like verticality, uh, I say people, about 85 to 95% most of the time, uh, verticality in the, um, uh, in the built form. They like something that speaks a bit of place more than of time. Uh, it, people are far more interested that what is built feels like it belongs here in this town or in this village or in this street than they are that it belongs in 1987 or 2016. Um, it's predictable what people will find beautiful. And again, I was referring to the metadata studies. In a range of studies done in the last few years, one particularly done by the University of Warwick with 1.5 million data points only last year, um, Beauty is correlated, liking where you live visually and aesthetically is correlated with your happiness and liking where you live. It is one of the most predictive drivers. It's always up there in the top two, three or four. So yes, you can predict it. And yes, it really matters. Well, if this is true, it has <coughs> major implications for the way government policy is formulated and how you turn that into uh, the specific goals um, for <coughs> civil servants and politicians generally. Um, and we'll come back to that uh, later on in our discussion. Um, now, Siren, uh, you're a very remarkable person in many ways, but one of the most remarkable things is the way in which you're a psychiatrist with an interest in that built environment. And this is what uh, led us to the Legatum Institute to commission you to, uh, to write, along with Bala, who's in the front uh, here, to uh, write that excellent report, Housing the Mind, which uh, researches the psychological and uh, psychiatric nature uh, of the of the built environment, can you just begin? Tell us something about the paper, why you wanted to write it, and we'll bring Bala into the discussion as well, in order to ensure parity of authorial treatment. So, why is this an important subject, and why are you attracted to it? Um, well, I've I've worked in inner city London. I work in lovely rural Oxfordshire now, so things have changed a lot for me. But I've spent my time in London, where we do a lot of home visits. We're, we're 
Psychiatrists are some of the few doctors that actually leave our surgery, uh, leave our hospitals. And we go out and see people at home. And it's a huge privilege for us, actually. I, I, th I think we're extremely lucky because we get to see how many, many people live in different areas from different stratas of society. I mean, obviously, the people are often in crisis and they're very unwell. But we get to go to all these different kinds of buildings. And I think there's one particular building that sticks in my mind. And I, I don't think I can ever, you know, I, it's hard to, de to describe the sort of feelings of, uh, of, I felt so threatened and uncomfortable when I went there. And it was a tower block and they had lifts that stopped either at even numbers or odd numbers. And there was just sounds. You could just hear sounds. And you could hear sounds in the stairwell and you couldn't see anyone. And it just felt incredibly unsafe and unpleasant. And the people I went to see um, didn't know the people who lived above them, and they were incredibly noisy. Um, and the people down below just played music 24 hours a day. There was no, there was no uh, opportunity for them to bump into them, to meet them casually on the stairs or in the lifts, because they would never meet in the lifts, because they never stopped at each other's floors. So these people were trapped in this terrible situation. And I'm sure there are people here who've been in homes where you've had noisy neighbours or difficulties in your uh, feeling sort of threatened when you've walked down sort of dark lanes and things. So it's a question of power, really, isn't it? Exactly. And I, I think it's, it's that feeling of being stuck mm. and being unable to move. And certainly some of these places that I've been to you know, I go to in daylight and I still feel quite anxious for my own safety. I think rightly so in some of the places, I have to say. But... Um, what, in Oxford? <laughs> You'd be continues. surprised. <laughs> Wallingford. Um, so, it, so I guess it sort of started from there, you know, how can we change this? And, and the other thing is being an inpatient consultant, you know, huge numbers of our patients are homeless <coughs> or have housing problems. And it's one of the major indicators that we look yeah. at in terms of our performance in the NHS in mental health is people's housing and how stable that is. Because the impact of housing on people's mental health in terms of improving it and sustaining wellness is huge. I can't tell you what an effect it has on people. So when we discharge people, we want to discharge people to a home from which they can then Oh. become stable in their mental health and so on. And so for us, as psychiatrists in the ward, in the community, housing is hugely important. Mm. I, think, I think I come from a slightly different viewpoint from Nick in that, you know, the, the housing, the stability of the housing is, is what's so important. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think nowadays we... The security. Have, security, security, exactly. Mm. So we, we have huge changes going on in society nowadays. I'm an old age psychiatrist, so I see mainly people, um, all the people I see are over 65, and they're increasingly living alone because they lose their partners and people live for longer. <coughs> more and more houses, uh, more, and more and more single flats are being built because our population is changing. More and more people are <coughs> being single for longer. Oh. Fewer people are living with children. Um, so I think culturally in terms of our housing, our population, and so on, with sort of thinking more that we're, we're changing as a, as a society. And I think the housing needs to start to reflect mm. that. I think we're also very lucky um, to have increasing amounts of research. It's very complicated to research um, psychology and housing, actually. It's, it's very hard to control for things because... Mm. But that's you know, why people have fought shy of doing so, yeah, so long. It's, Until they your are epoch making now. paper with Bala <laughs> here, boldly going forward and advancing uh, our Legatum uh, Institute proposal. But we'll, um, the, the paper can be read on our website um, as of today, and uh, we'll be returning to that issue as well later on. Um, Rowan, in your book, Slow Burn City, you've been arguing that the history of London has been one of continuous innovation, mm. creativity, mm. from days of Saxon farmers through Norman cathedral builders, mm. through City of London, Great Fire, mm. um, the 19th century um, Industrial Revolution, and then the rebuild after 1945. Mm. But you think it's come to a halt? It's ceased no. to be so innovative, and this is the fault of Greater London Authority? Um, not precisely. No. Um, 
And the book is, <laughs> the book is, is sort of motivated by love for this city and fascination with what's happening to it now, which is clearly a sort of extraordinary time in its history. Um, I mean, the ideal of London for me, as for any city, but I think London is particularly good at it, is that um, it's a place where anyone can find a niche. Anyone can make a home, build a life, have a business, have a family, whatever they want to do, discover their religious, sexual identity, whatever it is. Um, London has been very good at that um, through a kind of creative interplay and quite often sort of confrontation and competition between three elements, the private sector, the state, and the community, the pub public <coughs> action. I mm. can talk more about what I mean by that. In terms of housing and the fabric of that si the city, it means we have an incredibly rich and diverse uh, city with many, many different ways of living. There are terraces and squares, there are mansion blocks, there's pre-war LCC housing, there are some very good post-war uh, council estates as well as yes. the ones we all hate. Um, you have semi-detached suburbs, uh, you have converted warehouses, you have the whole gamut. And that enables people to live in all sorts of different ways. Not everybody wants a garden. Um, some people do, some people don't. Most people don't want to live in towers, but some do. Some people really want to live in the Trellick Tower or the Barbican or the Golden Lane Estate. Um, and I think the danger to all of that now is not coming from mad, ideological, dogmatic <coughs> architects, as might have been the case 50 or 60 years ago. Um, it's coming from the incredible pressure of uh, residential investment value, yes. where all those things are essentially converted into, into just monetary value. Um, and I think there's a, there's a quantity issue that then reflects on, on quality. So um, mm -hmm. we all know there's this incredible pressure. Targets of 40, 50,000 homes a year are set. We don't get above 30,000. Um, so then, certainly under the last mayor, permission was given to almost anything on the basis that it was sort of meeting those numbers. And the, the quality of what we were creating was, um, was really being lost sight of. But it's not, it's not <coughs> architects who are doing that. Mm -hmm. It's developers. And it's not even developers who are doing it. It's, it's developers acting under certain pressures, which kind of almost oblige them to act in this way. Well, we'll come back and ask a question about mm. developers and Nicholas here. Um, whether he wants to defend or attack the developers. Um, and Ben, you've been charting uh, with great accuracy the history of public attitudes towards housing um, and gradual emergence, that there is such a thing as a, as a housing crisis in London. Well, what does your polling tell us about how attitudes have changed in recent years? Well, the first thing is that you have in Britain, one thing we've done every month since 1974 is just ask the British public without any prompting, what's the biggest problem facing the country? And now in London, uh, we have the majority of people for the first time in over 40 years spontaneously saying housing. It's not true in the north of England. It's only 8% above um, around in, in northern England. But in London, some months, 54% of people will mention housing. They don't make, they aren't sophisticated in their analysis of supply and demand. And you know, that when you ask them what the problem is, it's not tall buildings and the, and the form of housing, which we'll come to, it's simple affordability. And they, they make very little connection between supply and demand in much of England. There are lots of places where people complain um, that you know, they, the house prices are too high, but also don't want any new building at all. That, you know, it's very, very common to see somewhere like Essex, people will sit in a meeting and draw a map around, a line around Essex and say, well, we'll have some new housing, but nobody who lives outside this line is going to be allowed to buy it, you know, this, this sort of thing. But in London, housing, uh, affordable housing is the number one issue. My personal thing about this, um, I, I studied architectural history as was before I became an opinion pollster, which is how I got involved with the Commission for an Architecture and the Built Environment before it was abolished, is that p people do care about the forms that they live in. And when we, we're about to release um, some work with, with London that we did earlier this year, face to face in people's own homes. It's not an internet panel. It's not ringing people up. We know where they live and we can compare in a London about a London. There is a clear problem building in terms of how people feel about quality of life. They think that all of the new shiny tower blocks, skyscrapers, lots of glass, very good for business, 
make it, it's part of the vibrancy of London, but they don't actually want to live in them. Their number one form that they want to live in, uh, and Nick has nothing to do with this survey, is a terraced house. Um, in the rest of England, it's bungalows. Of course, if we built as many bungalows as people actually wanted, it wouldn't happen. They accept that they can't have detached houses, but buildings of over 20 storeys, which we're about to cover uh, large parts of um, Surrey Docks in, uh, things like Nine Elms are not on most people's lists of where they actually would prefer to live. They want to live in something in a more human form. If we offer them pictures of different types of construction, they tend to favour things that look more like, more like traditional types of housing. Um, and actually, they're, you know, they aren't particularly keen on, on high rise and they're concerned about affordability. And looking at the prices of some of it and looking at average London wages, one can un understand that. They want, they feel disempowered. They don't feel there, there is much local control or the way local communities can do anything about it. They are not anti everything. Um, they accept that London's going to have new tall buildings, but they would like them restricted to particular areas of the capital. Um, and I, if that's populist, then so be it. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that we, you know, my job is to try and measure what people want. I've tried to do that in as objective and clear a way as I can. And I've tried to take on board some of the pressures that are behind this situation where, of course, borough, the London boroughs and indeed most councils have suffered some of the biggest cuts in the public sector uh, because it's often easiest to do for central government, exactly the same in this country as, as in other countries that have had to do fiscal consolidation after the crash of 2008. Local government is desperate for cash and partly for, as a result of that will we'll be quite happy to build virtually anything, particularly if that provides money for services for vulnerable people. When I put that to the public, and you'll see this in this poll, we, we thought we'd run that argument. What I found interesting was that half the public don't want to take the money if it means desecrating their community uh, in the way that we're seeing in some parts of London, even if that means there will be less services for people like them. It's a big data there. And Nicholas, the attack, attack on developers. But in a capitalist society, a society that is really on the whole in favour of the free market and individual liberty and economic freedom, um, if it's all the developers' fault, how do you get the developers to behave properly? Well, Rowan is um, both completely right and completely wrong when he blames the developers. Um, at a transaction level, at a particular thing happening here level, he's completely right. Um, I'm personally aware of, I've seen issues or instances, I should say, where developers have very flagrantly, and Rowan will know this very well, um, I was going to say fiddle, that might be going too far, uh, use creative uh, analysis uh, to justify a lower level of affordable housing than is actually necessary. Scotland Yard, how many they say they could put? They're eight. I don't, not many. It, was, it wasn't, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's so, so, you know, there are, um, you know, there is, you know, there are developers who are flagrantly exploiting the system and the process as it currently works. But, but, the reason that developers are uh, commercially incentivized to build this monstrous rubbish um, and to build flats that work great as investments, they think, and great as second homes and great as places. I mean, big buildings work well for, on the whole, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing for people who have another home without children and who are prosperous because the service costs of running big buildings are inexhaustibly and inescapably higher. Mm -hmm. uh, the Shakespeare Tower, for example, in the Barbican has service charges of £8,000 a year. And not only are they higher, they tend to go up more over time as the building ages and the technology ages. So, so the, the reason that the developers are incentivized to do this stuff, which is not rational in most terms, is because the land cost has become so elephantine. And the land cost has become so elephantine because there is such a constraint on building. And the, there's a, such a constraint on building because new building is so politically unpopular. Mm -hmm. And so to, to blame the developer is only to go a third of the way. To blame the planning system. You just said that's uh, wrong. I'm not sure what, what I've got wrong. Well, uh, the, that's quite a strong thing to say. The, the, reason, the reason the developers cannot be blamed ultimately is because it is the planning system that it is the. No, it is actually, the that, that's actually what uh, I'm saying. Because I, mis yeah. I misunderstood you, but, but it is the. I, I apologise. I, mean, I, 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 I did say they were. Yeah. They, it wasn't their fault because the they're put in that position. I, in that case, I, 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 I wasn't okay. paying attention fully, and I, I apologise. Let, let's, let's come on to the, the question. Can I just, can I just make two more seconds? I will, yeah. I will very quickly. Quick, 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 quick. But uh, until we unpick the popularity of new building, and Ben's done some interesting polling on this, but until you all new building. The majority of new building until you get to this, don't get to a situation where too often the response of a local councillor is to say yes there should be new building in principle but not right here right now in my ward because of this this that and the other until you unpick that political contradiction uh -huh. by having new development that is popular you won't fundamentally get get out of this quandary now you're also associated with the cause of more local planning 
And this is, this I think, is going to be one of the big issues in, in the years to come, when you have, on the one hand, one might say, at a time of increasing populism, um, rather frightened elites and backling and defending their inherited privileges as, as professionals. On the other hand, you have the, the cause of the people saying, let's have more decisions being taken locally, and some politicians will say, yes, more democracy. How is this local planning business going to actually work out, in your view, Rowan? Time for you to sort of... Um, I mean, I think it's complicated think. in London, hmm. because if you're looking at something like the redevelopment of Vauxhall Nine Elms, um, which for me is one of the great lost opportunities of London, hmm. could have been an absolutely magnificent place, and it's not going to be. Um, you know, who is the local community? There are people who live near there who have legitimate interests and rights. See what but the, over there. the community, but the community for a site like that is also the whole of London, if not the country, if not the world, because it's on the Thames, and the Thames hmm. is like a sort of an internationally famous space. Um, so I think you know, there has to be those different kinds of publics have to be represented. So I think it's a little naive to think you can just sort of go around consulting the immediate neighbours in the case of a development like that. And it does actually mean that you know, sometimes it does need something at the scale of the Greater London Authority to make good decisions. Um, you can't just do it all through meetings in town halls, um, much as we would all like that. Um, so we, you know, we do have a planning system and a political system that does, in theory, represent all these different levels of community, um, but it's just not working very well. Hmm. And uh, a community of determined by local planning system would actually, for those involved, take up an awful lot of free evenings. Which was Oscar Wilde's objection to socialism, really. Takes a lot of planning and sort of running drinks and so on. I mean, with, with Vauxhall Nyons, they did actually have public consultation, but yeah. in a very sort of tokenistic way. And yes. 300 people mm -hmm. turned up and yeah. ticked some boxes. Yeah. And, and the envelopes turning up beneath yeah. the door. Actually. Let's go around. Um, ben, it's typologies. Too much stuff about typologies. Well, it's just. And then the nature of power. Okay. Planning system is about power, it's about people with careers. About, I mean, it is about power. And I mean, on typologies, pe you know, people aren't obsessed about whether it's two stories or three stories or four stories. But overall, in terms of massing, in terms of um, you know, just this, this scale does matter. I think. And I, I think if we say scale doesn't matter, then we may as well give up and go home. And people repeatedly want something that is more ha boulevard houseman-like or round here like or you know some me low and medium rise rather than you know high rise blocks i mean that's very very simple there is no evidence that there is massive demand for you know for that and, and the affordability of those things the viability of them in the long term uh, just looks extremely challenged so you know what exactly is going to happen because the housing you know london is spontaneously london is saying affordable housing is the biggest issue it's it's a slow motion disaster story uh, which is causing all sorts of you know, disruptions. We need to take a, a firm look at it, but some of that does mean looking at the green belt, which actually most people, don't, as I say, don't even know exists. Um, so we do need to look at that. We do need to look at places like Havering, which are full of people sort of miserable in their semi-detached, and we may need to densify that. Now, that's, you know, that won't necessarily be popular, but, that's, you know, that, but, but it's about good planning. Um, and that's what, we, that's what we need at the moment. We're leaving things so much to you know, the vagaries of the market and what, people can, what, what local government can get its hands on in terms of cash, what developers can get away with. But we, we just don't seem to be getting to the solution that we all seem to think that we need. Now, quick sort of final conclusions from all members of the panel as we move along. Rowan, um, responding there. Well, to cut to the sort of absolutely fundamental issue, how do we build more housing in a way that doesn't wreck the city. Um, I mean, what I say in my book is you have to use every tool in the box. You can build on parts of the green belt. You can regenerate council estates. You can build on brownfield land. Um, you can densify suburbs. You can sometimes build towers. Um, you, um, you can actually also look at the, an awful lot of London is in the form of two-story terraces, which if you were building them now, you'd probably want them three or four. In theory, if you could rebuild those at three or four stories, that might be a good yeah. thing. So all these things are possible, but they're all difficult. 
So you do need planning, consultation, politics to make that happen. You have to really think about the legitimate interests of the people already there and how that can be respected at the same time that you increase the population of an area. Um, so you do need planning and proactive planning. And it also, as, as um, Ben was saying, I think you can't leave it everything to developers to build because they're just not delivering the numbers. And I think the public sector has to build more um, because there's a very clear correlation between uh, the days when the public sector built more, um, the supply of housing and the affordability of housing. Um, and since the, since the, the state built much less, uh, the price, the whole affordability issue has got out of control. And of course, lots of things went wrong the last time that happened, but possibly we could learn from that experience. Thank you. So. Um, I think it's a lot about fear of death, because what we tend to do <laughs> <laughs> is venerate what is elderly, what has lasted, because mm. we look at things like the Georgian buildings, I'm being quite literal, Barla, <laughs> We look at the Georgian buildings and we say they've lasted through mm. and we like that. We like that stability. We're human beings. We like familiarity and we like stability and we don't like things changing and we tend not to like new things initially until we, we become familiar with it. So I think we do, in some ways, we venerate the past mm -hmm. a bit too much. We venerate um, things like the green belt, which probably doesn't, is not so appropriate nowadays to the way we live. I think we need to take a large amount of risks, um, and they are challenging, and I don't think any government's going to be able to, uh, will have the wherewithal to do so. But if you give people homes, they thrive, they are active, they build communities, and that's what we need to do. So, houses, yes? Also homes, or ho in the well, title homes, of your wonderful, wonderful paper. Yes. Again, <laughs> readable on the Garden Institute website. Yes. Nicholas, I'm going to allow you to finish the next sentence without even raising the thought of the possibility, mm -hmm. however exciting it might be, of man-on-man -man combat. <laughs> <laughs> um, just quickly before I answer the last questions, Anna, I didn't get a chance to answer, just because they were in my head because I was talking about them in a meeting this morning, the Packington Estate in Islington and Myersfields North in Lambeth would be two. I'd give you a complete regen with, with strong local support, but there are more. Um, North Peckham Estate? Um, we can send lists. Um, only a very few states become deeply controversial in their estate regime because they're so badly managed, but that's another conversation. Just to the lady at the back from, uh, from the GLA on typologies, um, uh, in a word, no. Typology does matter. Uh, your experience as an individual is subjective. The objective experience of millions of people is, well, is not subjective. You can measure it, you can count it. You were referring to some of the research, I've been referring to others. Where people are happy, where they know their neighbours, where they get out to exercise, where their kids get to play every day and not cooped up inside a corridor, where people don't get mugged in stairwells, is measurable, is increasingly measured, and it is not a question of subjectivity. Your individual preference might be, but in aggregate it's not. So I think, you know, given your important role in the GLA, I think it's very worrying that you think that, if I can say so. Um, uh, nevertheless, I am hopeful. Um, uh, Deborah... Um, uh, talked about the new, new version of London plan. There is a huge opportunity out there. We know from our polling, we know from our work with over a dozen communities now across London, that when, and this is also shown in some research, that when communities are engaged with honestly, I not, here is a thing, and here's a funny question where we're not going to really count the answers, what do you think, by the way, we know what you're going to say, and we've sort of set the questions. When, when communities are worked with properly, when they're allowed to help shape it, when the, their local knowledge properly feeds through into what is built, not only do you get support for new housing in principle, which you're seeing go up in the polling that ben, mm -hmm. Ben's firm doing, that's been going up sharply for the last few years, that turns into not just support, but passionate support for new housing locally. We, we as you know, did some work in Mount Pleasant. We worked up a proposal, and Paul was involved with the local community, um, where we put more housing, slightly less green space, then we'll fiddle around uh, across the site, um, and we get 99% support from the local community for a scheme that actually has more building in it, though it's just more evenly distributed. So the, the London plan needs to take the opportunity of, actually there are still large amounts of brownfield and, and certainly large growing field opportunities, to unleash that support for new building and do that in a way which 
uh, fundamentally changes the planning system, doesn't get rid of planning, but starts planning properly and setting a carapace around which people's enthusiasm and latent desire for new housing can be unleashed. So I'm very hopeful for the future. Uh, this evening has been organised with the very active support and encouragement of the London Festival of Architecture, and I'd like to thank that month-long uh, uh, feast of uh, syllabus planning and event coordination uh, for their help. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your collective encouragement and blend of wits and gravity and wisdom displayed here collectively, and perhaps sometimes consciously as well as unconsciously. And I would like to thank, ladies and gentlemen, your panel here this evening for responding to these questions with such alacrity and uh, displaying themselves, such a combination of wit and gravity, and considering one of the great social questions of our time. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>